In this video, we're going to be looking at basic trig identities and how to use them to solve trigonometric equations. A trig equation is an equation that involves a trig function or functions. And when we solve it, what we do is find a value for the trig function and then find the angle that corresponds to that particular trig function. But what we want to start is with the idea of a right angled triangle and go back to the well-known theorem of Pythagoras. So let's begin with our right angled triangle there. Put the right angle in and let's label the sides and the angles. So we'll have this as a side of length A, this as a side of length B, and the hypotenuse, the side that is opposite the right angle, we'll call C. And I'll label this angle here the angle A. Now, Pythagoras' theorem tells us that if we take the square of this side and the square of this side, add them together, we'll get the square of this side. So Pythagoras' theorem tells us that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Now, let's divide throughout by c squared. Divide every term in this equation by c squared. So we have a squared over c squared plus b squared over c squared is equal to, and at this side we would have c squared over c squared. But that, of course, is just 1. Now we can rewrite a squared over c squared as a over c all squared. And we can do the same here with b squared over c squared. We can rewrite that as b over c all squared. And it's still equal to 1. Let's go back to this triangle again. What does a over c represent? Well, a over c is the side opposite to the angle A, divided by the hypotenuse. And so opposite divided by hypotenuse is sine. So this A over C is sine of A, sine of the angle A. And we have to square it. Now, we could write it like that, sine A squared. And for the moment, I will. Plus and let's have a look at B over C. Well, B is the adjacent side to the angle A, and C is the hypotenuse. So B over C is adjacent over hypotenuse, and that's cosine. So we can replace B over C by cos A, and we need to square it. And that's still equal to 1. Now, this notation, sine squared, I just said sine squared. So rather than writing it as sine A squared, which might be confused with squaring the A, let's put the square on the sine. And so the notation for the sine of A times by the sine of A is sine squared A, written like that. Plus, and we use exactly the same technique, cos squared A equals 1. Now that is an identity because it is true for all angles A like this in a right angle triangle. However, I could have done this for the definitions of sine and cosine that come from a unit circle. In which case, this identity would be true for all angles A, no matter what their size. And that's the case. This is a basic trig identity. That sine squared of an angle plus cos squared of an angle equals 1. It's true for all angles. We want to develop this identity now to give us two more basic identities. So, let's begin 
with sine squared a plus cos squared a equals 1. Our basic fundamental identity, and one that you really must learn and know and come to recognise every time that you see it. What I want to do is divide everything by this term here, cos squared a. So sine squared a divided by cos squared a plus cos squared a divided by cos squared a is 1 over cos squared a. Now because I've divided everything by cos squared, this is still a true equation. Still, in fact, an identity. So sine squared over cos squared. Well, sine over cos is tan. And so this is, in fact, tan squared a. Plus cos squared divided by cos squared is just 1. Now, 1 over cos is sec, and so we can rewrite this as sec squared a. And so we have another identity. And normally, we would write this as sec squared a is 1 plus tan squared a. So there's our second basic fundamental identity that's derived directly from sine squared plus cos squared is 1. Well, if we can divide this equation by cos squared, surely we can do the same thing but with sine squared. So we can divide the whole of this equation by sine squared. So, we start again by writing down our basic fundamental identity that sine squared plus cos squared is 1. And as we said, instead of dividing everything by cos squared, we're going to divide everything by sine squared. So there we have everything in the identity divided by sine squared. So it's still true for all angles A. Sine squared divided by sine squared, that's just 1. Plus, now, we've cos squared divided by sine squared. So we've cos divided by sine all squared. And cos divided by sine is just cot. So that is cot squared A equals and here we've 1 over sine squared. 1 over sine is cosec. And so 1 over sine squared is cosec squared. And so there we have our third fundamental identity. 1 plus cot squared is cosec squared. So we've now got three basic fundamental identities. Let's just write them down here in this corner. Sine squared A plus cos squared A is 1. 1 plus tan squared A is sec squared A. And 1 plus cot squared A is cosec squared A. Now, the use that we're going to make of these is to help us solve particular kinds of trigonometric equations. So, first of all, let's look at this one. 2 tan squared x is equal to sec squared x. What we need to do is, looking at this equation, relate it to one of these three identities. And it's fairly obvious that this is the one. So what we need to do then is get everything in terms of 
either tans or sex. Well, our identity says that sex squared is equal to 1 plus tan squared. So let's replace the sex squared here by 1 plus tan squared. So we have 2 tan squared x is equal to 1 plus tan squared x. And now we can take tan squared away from each side, which will leave us with 1 tan squared at this side, and equals 1 there. So now we can take the square root of both sides, so tan x is equal to 1. And let's not forget, when we take a square root, we've got two answers, plus or minus 1 in this case. Now, the one thing that we didn't specify at the beginning of this question was what was the range of values that we were going to be working with for x. Well, since we didn't specify at the beginning, I think we're entitled to put in any range of values that we want. So, for the moment, let's say that we're going to look at this for x between or equal to 0, but less than 2 pi. So tan x is 1 or minus 1. Let's sketch the graph of tan x between 0 and 2 pi. So it looks like that. Our asymptote, like that. The asymptote, and like that. This is 2 pi. This one we know is pi by 2. This, where it crosses the x-axis, is pi. And this one here is 3 pi by 2. Tan x equals 1. That's one of those special angles. 45 degrees, if we were working in degrees, or pi by 4 radians, if we're working in radians. So for the 1 bit, we want pi by 4. But where else do we want to be? Here's 1. And if we go across the tan graph, we can see we meet it here. That's the pi by 4, and we meet it here. And that is going to be in there, halfway between pi and 3 pi by 2. And so that is going to be at 5 pi by 4. So there's our second answer coming from the 1. And then we've got the minus 1. So let's go across at minus 1 till we meet the graph. There and there. This is halfway between pi by 2 and pi. And so that's going to be 3 pi by 4. And this one is halfway between 3 pi by 2 and 2 pi. And so that's going to be 7 pi by 4. And so there are our four solutions to this question. Let's take another example, and this time I'm going to take one that will make use of one more of these particular basic identities. So 2 sine squared x plus cos x equals 1. Now, this has got sine squareds in it and a cos. Well, fairly obviously, I think we ought to be using sine squared plus cos squared is 1. But what do we replace? Do we try and replace the cos or do we try and replace the sine? We've got a choice. Well, the identity says sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So if it's sine squared that's in the identity, then perhaps it's the sine squared that we ought to replace. So let's make that replacement. Instead of sine squared, because sine squared plus cos squared is 1, sine squared must be 1 minus cos squared. So in there, we'll write 1 minus cos squared x plus cos x equals 1. 
multiply out the brackets, 2 minus 2 cos squared x plus cos x equals 1. Well, if we simplify this, what we're going to end up with is a quadratic equation where the variable is going to be cos x. So let's move this term, minus 2 cos squared x, over to this side of the equation by adding 2 cos squared x to each side so that we get it positive at this side. And so what I want to end up with is an equation that's equal to 0. So equal 0, add this to both sides, 2 cos squared x, take this away from both sides because that's plus cos x, so minus cos x, take the 2 away from both sides, so that's 1, take away this 2, is minus 1. As we said before, this is now just a quadratic. So let's see if we can factorise it, remembering that the variable is cos x. Well, we want two numbers that will multiply together to give us 2 cos squared x, which suggests perhaps 2 cos x and cos x. We want two numbers that will multiply together to give us minus 1. Well, let's put 1s in for the moment and worry about the sign now. If I take 2 cos x times by 1 here, I will get just 2 cos x. And if I take 1 by cos x here, I will get just cos x, and I want to end up with minus cos x, which means I've really got to take away the result of doing this multiplication. So I want the minus sign there and a plus sign there. So what does this tell us? If this expression is equal to 0, then either 2 cos x plus 1 equals 0, or cos x minus 1 equals 0. This gives us a nice little equation that says cos x is equal to, I'll take 1 away from both sides, so that's minus 1, and divide both sides by 2. So cos x is equal to minus a half, or cos x is equal to 1. And so in order to solve this equation at the top, I've now reduced it to solving these two much simpler equations at the bottom. So I'll turn over the page now and take these two with me. So cos x is equal to minus a half, or cos x is equal to 1. Now again, when we started solving this, we did not have a range of values for cos x. So let's say that again, we're going to work with this range of values. x is greater than or equal to 0, but less than 2 pi. And what we need to do first is sketch the graph of cos x in that range. So the graph of cos x in that range looks like that. This is pi by 2, this is pi, 3 pi by 2, and 2 pi. And this is 1 on the y-axis and minus 1 on the x-axis. So, what are our values? Well, let's take this equation first. Cos x equals 1. If we go across at 1... We've got this value here, x equals 0, and this value here, x equals 2 pi. But this here says x is strictly less than 2 pi. So if I included it, be right to cross it out, because it's not within the range of values. 
Let's now have a look at this. Cos x equals minus a half. Well, minus a half is there. So let's go across and see where this meets the graph. There and there. Right. This, again, is connected with one of those very special angles. If cos x had been equal to a half, then x would be equal to 60 degrees or pi by 3. That's about there. These curves are symmetric, so this one, instead of being pi by 3 from there, is pi by 3 back from pi. And so this tells us that x is equal to 2 pi by 3, or it's pi by 3 on from there, which gives us 4 pi by 3. So there we've got our answers, two of them there and one of them there. So let's take another example. 3 cot squared x is equal to cosec x minus 1. So the identity with, that we want is the one that talks to us about cot squared and cosec squared. But which term should we replace? Now let's recall the identity is 1 plus cot squared x is cosec squared x. Well, as we saw in the last example, we want to arrive at a quadratic that we can factorise. It therefore makes no sense to try and substitute for the cosec, because to do that we'd have to get square roots in it. But if we substitute for the cot squared, we can do so much better, because we will just have a direct substitution that will involve cosec squared and hopefully get a quadratic. So instead of cot squared, we'll replace it by changing this around that tells us that cot squared x is equal to cosec squared x minus 1. So that will be 3 cosec squared x minus 1 is equal to cosec x minus 1. Multiply out the brackets. 3 cosec squared x minus 3. Don't forget, when you multiply out brackets, you must multiply everything inside the bracket by what's outside. So we've got to have the 3 times by the minus 1 there. Equals cosec x minus 1. Let's get everything on one side of the equation, so it says equals 0. Keep the square term to be the positive term. That makes factorization easier. So 3 cosec squared x. Take away this cosec from each side. And now I've minus 3 here, and I've minus 1 here. I want to take the minus 1 over to that side, so I have to add 1 to each side. So minus 3 plus 1 is minus 2 equals 0. And now factorize this equation. The variable is cosec, so we're going to have 3 cosec in here and cosec x in there, because that times by that will give us that term there, 3 cosec squared x. And now I've got the minus 2 to deal with. Well, 2 itself is 2 times by 1. If I put the 2 in here, then I'm going to multiply the 2 by the 3. And that's going to give me 6, which is a very big number in association with the cosec. I only want minus 1 cosec. So let's put the 2 in there and the 1 in there. Now I've got to balance the signs. I want minus 2 here. So one of these has got to be negative, And I see that 
what's going to make the decision for me is this minus cosec x. So I need the bigger bit in size to be negative, which seems to me that the 3 cosec x has got to go with a minus 1. So 3 cosec times by minus 1 is minus 3 cosec, and then I've got plus 2 cosec there, gives me the minus the single cosec that I want. Solving a quadratic, two brackets multiplied together equals 0. That means one of these brackets, or the other one, has got to be equal to 0. So, for this one, I can take 2 away from each side and divide by 3. So we have cosec x is equal to minus 2 over 3 or minus 2 thirds. And then here, cosec x is equal to 1. So again, we've reduced an equation like this to solving two much smaller, much simpler equations. So, taking these two over the page, cosec x is minus 2 thirds, or cosec x is 1. Now, what is cosec? Cosec is 1 over sine x. So, let's write that down. If we just look at this, 1 over sine x equals 1, well, that can only mean that sine x itself is equal to 1. And if we can turn this upside down, we can do the same at this side. So turning that back upside down, sine x is equal to minus 3 over 2. Now, when we began this equation, and we began to solve it, we didn't state a range of values of x. So let's use the range again that we've been using, and that is x greater than or equal to 0, but less than 2 pi. Let's just sketch the graph of sine x over that range of values. The graph of sine x will look like that, going from 0 through pi by 2, pi, 3 pi by 2, and 2 pi. And it will range between plus 1 and minus 1. So again, if we look at this solution here, we can see straight away we've got the one solution here at x equals pi by 2. Let's have a look at this one. Sine x equals minus 3 over 2. Well, that's here. And of course, there's a problem. This doesn't meet the graph anywhere. There are no values of x that will produce minus 3 over 2, because sine is contained between plus 1 and minus 1. That doesn't mean that we've done it wrong. All it means is that there are no values of x that come from this equation. And so the only solutions are those that come from this equation here. So this is our answer and our only answer. We'll take one more example. This one is cos squared x minus sine squared x is equal to zero. Now, we've got an identity that says cos squared plus sine squared is one. So I could choose to replace either the cos squared or the sine squared. But the reason I've chosen this example is that you can do it another way. So, let's have a look at the other way. This is cos squared minus sine squared. So in algebra terms, it's the difference of two squares. It's a squared minus b squared. And that has a standard factorization 
of a minus b, a plus b. So this factorises as cos x minus sin x and cos x plus sin x equals zero. So one of these two brackets, one or the other, is equal to zero. So cos x minus sin x equals zero or cos x plus sin x equals zero. Let's develop this one first. Cos x minus sin x equals zero means that they must be the same. Cos x and sin x are the same. Divide both sides by cos x and we get sine over cos, which is tan. And so tan x is equal to dividing both sides by cos x. Cos divided by cos is just 1. Or, look at this one, take cos x away from each side and we have sin x is equal to minus cos x. Divide both sides by cos x. Sin x over cos x is again tan x, and minus cos x divided by cos x is minus 1. We've broken that down into two separate equations. Let's have a look at how we solve them. Again, let's assume that the range of values of x is 0 to 2 pi, and let's sketch the graph of tan in that range. These sketches don't have to be accurate, just enough to give us a picture of the symmetry of the curve to help us solve the equation. Tan x is 1. We know that this is one of those special angles, that it's 45 degrees in degrees, but since we're working in radians, it's x equals pi by 4. In other words, we're across here at 1, and there is pi by 4, halfway between 0 and pi by 2. So again, this is pi, and the one we want is there. That will be halfway between pi and 3 pi by 2. So this is going to give us the one that is halfway between pi and 3 pi by 2, 5 pi by 4. With this one, we're at minus 1. So we're down here, meets it there, halfway between pi by 2 and pi. And so x there is going to be 3 pi by 4, and meets the curve again here, halfway between 3 pi by 2 and 2 pi, and so that's going to be 7 pi by 4. So, by spotting that we could factorise this equation, we didn't need to use the identity. And we came up with these solutions. If you want, you can use the identity. Notice what we get here are the, all the pi by 4s, if you like. All the odd pi by 4s. Pi by 4, 5 pi by 4, 3 pi by 4, 7 pi by 4. So let's have a look at this equation again. Cos squared x minus sine squared x equals 0. And we're going to use our basic trig identity to solve it. So we know that sine squared x plus cos squared x is equal to 1. I'm going to replace the sine squared here. So let's have a look. What is sine squared according to our identity? Well, sine squared x, if we take away cos squared from each side, is 1 minus cos squared x. So I'm going to take that, put it in there. Cos squared x minus, and then a bracket, 1 minus cos squared x. And I use the bracket because I'm taking away all of this expression. Not just a little bit of it, but 
all of it. So the brackets show that. Now I need to remove the brackets. Cos squared x minus 1 and minus minus gives me a plus cos squared x equals 0. So now I've cos squared plus cos squared, that's two of them. 2 cos squared x equals 1 by adding this 1 to both sides. Now let me divide by 2. Cos squared x is 1 over 2. Now at this point, I could say 1 over 2, a half, that's 0 0.5, and get my calculator out, because I'm going to have to take a square root. But I don't want to do that. And why not? Well, a half is a nice number. And I happen to know, for instance, that sine 30 is a half, cos 60 is a half. I also know that sine of 45 and cos of 45 are both 1 over the square root of 2. So there are enough indications here to suggest to me that there is a nice relationship between the angle and the cosine that I'm, that I'm going to get when I take the square root. So I don't want to spoil that relationship by messing it up with a lot of decimals through a calculator. So let's take that square root. Cos of x is 1 over the square root of 2. But I've taken a square root. So that means not only must I have plus, but I must have minus. Now, we didn't say at the beginning what was the range of values of x. So let's take the range that we've been working with, namely between 0 and 2 pi. So a sketch of the graph just to help us see where we are. Here, pi by 2. Here, pi. 3 pi by 2 there and 2 pi there. And our cosine function ranges between 1 and minus 1. And we know that the cosine of x is 1 over root 2. We know that's 45 degrees or in radians pi by 4. So we know that we're here at pi by 4. And of course, right across there, and again, halfway between these two. So this bit is telling us x is pi by 4, or its partner is here, halfway between 3 pi by 2 and 2 pi, 7 pi by 4. And then for minus 1 over root 2, we're going to be about there. Go across to the graph, up to the x-axis, and again, this, by the symmetry of the curve, must be halfway between pi by 2 and pi, and so that gives us 3 pi by 4, and here again, halfway between pi and 3 pi by 2, so again, that gives us 5 pi by 4. So in solving this equation a different way, we've got the same set of answers. And again, we can recognize them because these are the odd pi by 4s. Pi by 4, 3 pi by 4, 5 pi by 4, and 7 pi by 4. So whether we do this solution of the equation by using this method, using the identity, or the method that we had before where we factorized it doesn't matter. And that's true in solving any of these trig equations. The method that you use shouldn't matter. It should always give the same set of answers. But let's just recap where we started from. These three basic and fundamental identities. Sine squared x plus cos squared x is equal to 1. 1 plus cot squared x is equal to cosec squared x. And 1 plus tan squared x is equal 
to sec squared x. Those are our three fundamental trigonometric identities, and they must be learned, they must be known, and you must be able to recognise them whenever you see them.